welcome to lecture 21 of Fox. We're going to be talking about deviations from the mean. Or, how good is the mean at summarizing the outcome of an experiment with respect to the quantity, the measurement that we are interested in, okay, which we call the random variable. Now, last time, we talked about computing expected values, spe specifically the expected value of a sum. Okay, the expected value of a sum is the sum of expected values. And we applied this to the sum of dice, the binomial, which we represent as a sum of binary or Bernoulli random variables, the waiting time, which we had to sort of creatively represent as a sum of waiting times to uh, each success, and we applied that to coupon collecting. Okay. Then we talked about the law of total expectation and how that can be used to, to, to compute expectations in a build-up fashion. And, you know, finally, we, you know, discussed the, you know, the, this novel concept of you know, indicator random variables, which are Bernoulli random variables that become very useful if you can represent your random variable as a sum of indicators. Then, you know, the expected value is the sum of the expected values of the indicators, and the, and the expected value of an indicator is very easy to compute. It's just the probability of success for that indicator. Okay, so be on the lookout for sums of indicator random variables. Now, what are we going to talk about today? The main goal is to discuss the quality of the expected value. And we're going to call sometimes the expected value the mean. So how well does the mean summarize the experiment, summarize the random variable? And we're, so we're going to introduce the variance, okay? and then we're going to use this variance to, to develop what's called the three sigma rule. So basically, the variance is, the, is sigma squared. And basically, we're going to show that you know whenever you run the experiment, what you observe, the outcome, the random variable will be, roughly speaking, 90% of the time within three sigma of the expected value, within three sigma of the mean. And we call this the three sigma rule. Okay. So you know, let's, uh, let's begin and you know, let's start from the very beginning. So we start with an experiment. It's a random experiment, okay? so that means that the outcome is uncertain and it's a complex experiment, so the outcomes are complex. Okay? So we're not so interested in the complex outcomes, so we summarize, we sort of simplify the outcomes with respect to this, this thing that we are interested in measuring, this quantity that you know, we represent by a random variable. Okay? So a random variable represents, simplifies the outcome to the quantity of interest, like the number of heads in, in 100 coin tosses. We're not really interested in each individual head. We are interested in um, you know, the number of heads. Or if, you, if, if 100 kids throw their hats in the, in the air and the hats ran, ha, land randomly on their heads, we're not interested in specifically who got what hat. We might be only interested in how many kids got the correct hat. Okay. So this measurement we call a random variable. It summarizes the outcome. Okay. And associated with, the, with this measurement, with this random variable, are possible values and probabilities for those values. And that becomes our new sort of sample space and probability distribution function. And we can now more or less ignore the complex experimental outcomes okay. and focus on the random variable. And then we summarized even more. We said, wow. The random variable has all these possible outcomes and all these probabilities associated with each possible measured value. Okay, can we summarize that? We summarize that in the expected value. So what's going to happen if you run the experiment many times, take the measurement many times, and then average those? Okay, in some sense, you know, what do you expect to happen in the experiment when you run it and measure the quantity of interest? And that's the expected value. And how good is that? How good is that at summarizing the outcome of the experiment? That's what we're going to study today. How good is the expected value or mean at summarizing the outcome of the experiment? Here's an experiment that you know you can do. So roll n dice. Okay, so you roll n dice, and now the measurement we're going to make is the average of the rolls. So take the sum and divide by n. That's going to be our random variable of interest. Okay, the measurement, the quantity that we are interested in. Okay. Now let's compute the expected value of this random variable. What is this random variable? It's the average of the n rolls. Okay. So we want the expected value of the average. Okay. So that's, that's important to make, to make sure that you realize we're computing the expected value of the average. And what is the average? The average is the sum divided by n. Okay. So we're computing the expected value of the sum divided by n. Okay. And this 1 over n is crucial here. Okay, because, you know, we have the linearity of expected value, which says that we can take this constant 1 over n outside the expectation. Okay, so we get 1 over n times the expected value of a sum, but now we know that the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. Okay, and so we get the sum of the expected values of n dice rolls. Okay, and each dice roll is, you know, basically the same. They're independent, identical dice rolls. So each of them has the expected value 3 and a half from, you know, last lecture. And so the sum will have an expected value that is 
n times that because we take the sum of the individual n expected values. So the, the, so the expected value of the sum is n times 3.5. We multiply by the 1 over n, the n's cancel, and we get 3.5. Now that's interesting. Okay. So when we roll n dice and take the average of the rolls, the expected value of that average is 3.5, three and, and it is independent of the number of dice we roll. Now that's a bit surprising. right? The expected value of the average is independent of the number of dice we roll. And that's precisely because we're computing the average. Okay? On the other hand, if you think about it, you know, if we roll one dice, okay, the average is just the value rolled, and that's wildly fluctuating between one and six. Okay? On average, in expected value, okay, if, we did, if we repeated that experiment of rolling one dice and taking the average many, many times, we'll get three and a half. But any specific roll could be anywhere from one to six. Okay? So it varies wildly in comparison to the expected value. On the other hand, what happens if we roll 100 dice and take the average? So I did this experiment. Okay. So I, you know, I rolled one dice, took the average. Rolled two, three, four, and so on, up to 10,000, up to 100,000, and took the average. And what, what do we observe? Okay. What we observe is that when I rolled a small number of dice, you see how the outcome, the actual outcome, this is, so I roll the dice, take the average. So for example, I roll 10 dice, take the average, and this is the actual outcome. And it's fluctuating around the expected value of 3.5, and the fluctuations are quite large. Okay. But as I take the average of more and more dice, so when my experiment involves 10,000 dice or 100,000 dice, okay, I roll, I take the average, and look, it's, the actual outcome doesn't fluctuate much around 3.5. Okay. So to understand what's going on here, let's compare two cases, rolling four dice versus rolling 100 dice. Okay. And, you know, so, uh, on the left, I'm showing the, 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 the random variable, which corresponds to the average of four dice. So what, what, what are we seeing on the x-axis here? On the x-axis are the possible values. So one up to, up to six in intervals of one fourth. Okay. And, you know, what we're showing here is the probability distribution function for the average of four dice. Okay. So each possible outcome. And then how likely is that outcome? And we see that, you know, the outcomes around 3.5, which is the expected value, are by far the most likely outcomes. Okay. But, it's still quite reasonably likely to get a five, or even a six, or two, or a one. Okay, so there's some range which includes the likely values, and then outside this range is unlikely to occur. And so we've, you know, we've quantified this range by, you know, a width of this PDF, which we have labeled sigma. Now we have a specific idea what sigma should be, but for the moment, intuitively think of this as the range within which the likely outcomes of this experiment will occur, the average of four dice. Okay, and roughly speaking, the range is let's say two to five. Okay, so sigma is approximately one point five. Let us say. Okay, now what about? You know, the average of 100, that's totally different picture. You see, even though one is possible, you could get all 100 ones and the average is one, but it hardly ever happens. In fact, in my experiment, it never happened. Okay, and the, the outcomes for, for the average of 100 dice are pretty much, you know, in the range three to four. Okay, and so the width of this uh, PDF, you know, the, the likely range for the random variable is much smaller. Okay, so what do we observe? When you roll a small, uh, a, a small number of dice, the actual outcome, the actual average, oscillates reasonably wildly around the actual uh, expected value. So the, the variations are large. Okay, there's a lot of variability. But when you, roll, when you roll a larger number of dice, the variability is small. And that's what we're going to quantify today. And we're going to start by defining the variance and then use the variance to show that you know, we can get a very convenient range for a random variable which, you know, which, which says that your random variable will be within this range with, you know, high probability, with, let's say, 90% chances, approximately. We have two main goals for this lecture. The first is to motivate, define, and see how to compute the variance. Okay? And what's the variance? It's a measure of the expected deviation from the mean, okay, where the mean is the expected value of your random variable. So it's, it's a measure of the expected deviation from the mean when you actually run the experiment. When you run the experiment, the actual outcome may deviate from the mean. Okay, And how much do we expect it to deviate? Okay, And then we're going to use the variance to describe what are the likely outcomes when you actually run the experiment. So what are the likely outcomes of the random variable? So let's start with the variance. So the variance. Okay, So it's a measure of the expected deviation from the mean. So from now on, we're going to call the expected value of a random variable the mean. 
Okay, because otherwise we have too many expecteds flying around, so it's a little bit more convenient. Okay, so let's consider an experiment. Uh, roll two dice and take the sum. Okay, so sum of two dice. Okay, and what are the possible outcomes? So the random variable is the sum. What are the possible outcomes? So we know the possible outcomes. The possible outcomes are 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. And what are the probabilities? So the probability, probability p sub x of little x, so the outcome little x, okay, 1 over 36, 2 over 36, 3 over 36, 4 over 36, 5 over 36, 6 over 36, 5 over 36, 4 over 36, 3 over 36, 2 over 36, 1 over 36. Okay, so those are the probabilities. Okay. And, you know, we computed the expected value. So the expected value, and we typically use, so you have a random variable x, okay, its expected value is expected value of x, and we, we often refer to this as mu, mu for mean, mu for m, mu. Okay. And so we computed the mean mu is equal to, you know, you weight 2 times this probability plus 3 times this probability and so on. Okay, so the expected value is 2 times 1 over 36 plus 3 times uh, 2 over 36 plus and so on plus 12 times 1 over 36 and this was equal to 7. Okay, so mu, uh, mu equals 7. Okay, now if you run this experiment, you, you, you will observe either 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. You may not necessarily observe the mean of 7. Okay. So, what are the, so we can define the deviation, deviation, okay, delta, which is the deviation from the mean. Okay. So this is, you know, when you run the experiment, you measure a random variable value x, okay, and you subtract from, from it the mean, x minus the mean, mu. Okay, so this is the deviation, okay, the difference between the observed value and the mean. Now, by the way, the mean is a constant, it's just some number. Okay, it's not going to change each time you run the experiment. What changes each time you run the experiment is the random variable x. Okay, but when you run it, we can see how far did you deviate from the mean. So what are the, you know, for each possible outcome, there's a possible deviation. So let me uh, uh, list the, the deviation. So if the actual value, the observed value is 2, the deviation is minus 5. 3, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, no deviation okay, if the actual observed value is 7. Okay, now we have a deviation of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there are possible deviations. Okay. And, you know, so pop quiz. You know, pop quiz. Okay. So first, I want to emphasize that, you know, the deviation is another example of a random variable because look, it, it, you know, it takes on possible values, okay, and each of these possible values comes with a probability. Now, it turns out that this deviation is, is very closely related to the actual observed random variable x, the measurement we're interested in. You just take the measurement and subtract the mean. So, this deviation is a function of the random variable x. Okay, we've seen functions of a random variable before. Okay, so the deviation delta is a random variable. Okay, it is a random variable. Okay, and so we can take the expected value of the deviation. So the pop quiz for these deviations, what is the expected value of the deviation? Okay, so give you five seconds, compute the expected value of the deviation. One, pause the video. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so unpause if you're coming back and you just are here for the ride. Okay. Uh, uh, great. If you figured out that the deviation has an expected value, which is zero. Okay, fantastic. And you could have done that by just seeing that, you know, this five and that five will, you, you multiply this guy by its probability. Okay, you get minus five times one over 36, five times one over 36, they cancel. Then the fours cancel with the minus four. Three and minus three cancel. Two and minus two cancel. One and minus one cancels. And this is a deviation of zero. Okay. In fact, it is generally the case that when you take the deviations from the mean of a random variable, the expected value is zero. Why? Because we're taking the expected value of x minus mu, and the expected value of a sum is a sum of expected values. This is the expected value of x minus the expected value of mu. Okay. And the expected value of x is by definition mu. Okay. And this is just a constant. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a constant. So the expected value of a constant is just a constant itself. Okay, so mu minus mu equals zero, always. 
So the expected value of deviations is always zero. So the deviations themselves, if you take the expected value, is always zero. It doesn't, it doesn't quantify how likely it is to that you will observe something that deviates from the mean. And that's because when we say deep, when we typically talk about deviates from the mean, what are the deviations from the mean? We're only interested in the size. So, you know, the fact that this is a minus five and the fact that that's a five, you know, they both have size five, okay? So, um, it turns out that the size itself, okay, that's one way to get all positive deviations, but the size is inconvenient to work with. Okay? It's more convenient to work with the square. So, let's look at the deviation squared. Okay, so this is 25, 16, 9, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. So those are the deviations squared. Okay. And so pop quiz. Pop quiz. Compute the expected value of the deviations squared. Okay, so pop quiz compute it. So you just, you know, it, what is it? Okay. So uh, I'll pause the video, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, give you a chance to do it, and then I'll show you what it is. So the expected value of the deviations squared is, you know, 1 over 36 times 25, 1 over 36 times 25, plus uh, 2 over 36 times 16, uh, 2 over 36 times 16, plus 3 over 36 times 9, plus, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the last term here will be plus 1 over 36 times 25, and that is exactly 5 and 5 sixths. So if you pause the video and got 5 and 5 sixths, fantastic! You know how to compute expected values, even of complicated random variables. Good. Okay. What you will observe is that the deviations are all positive. Okay. I mean, sorry, the deviations squared are all positive because we're squaring a real number. And so the expected value is, is you, you, you know, you multiply positive probabilities with positive squares and then you add them up. So the expected deviation is always positive. So no surprise here. Okay. And it turns out that this expected squared deviation is this important quantity that we call the variance. Okay, so definition. Well, the variance is equal to the expected value of the deviations squared. So for random variable x, for random variable x, and the deviation delta is equal to x minus its mean, which is equal to x minus its expected value. Okay, so that's the definition of the variance. Okay. But you will observe that the variance, in some sense, has the dimension of the deviation squared. So it's a square of a deviation. So if we want to measure the deviations, then we should take the square root. Okay. And so the square root of the variance okay, is also an important quantity, so definition. The standard deviation. is equal to the square root of the variance, which is the square root of the expected value of the deviation squared, which is the square root of the expected value of the random variable x minus its mean squared. Okay, so this here is the expected value of x minus its mean squared. That's the variance. Okay, so two important definitions. Okay, and if we take the square root, of this guy, then the standard deviation, so the standard deviation, now we typically give the symbol sigma for s, sigma to the standard deviation, and so sigma is the square root of the variance, so the variance is, we typically call sigma squared. Okay. So for the sum of two dice, so for the sum of two dice, the variance sigma squared is equal to 5 and 5 sixths. And the standard deviation is the square root of that. Square root of 5 and 5 of 5 sixths, which is equal to approximately 2.52. Okay. And sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, that uh, the sum of two dice, or the sum of two dice, is 7, it's mean, so this is the mean, mu, plus or minus 2.52. This is the standard deviation. Now we'll soon, we'll see later in this class, um, 
you know, in what sense this is true. So you can think about it as identifying a range, 7 plus or minus 2.52, okay, when you roll a pair of dice, that's the likely outcome, somewhere in this range, you know, uh, which is uh, approximately 4.5 to 9.5 when you roll the sum of two dice. Okay. All right, let's take another example, and, you know, very often, you know, uh, probability is used in, in analyzing gambling games. Okay, so let's take an example of a gambling game. And that will show you one of the other interpretations of the, of the variance, which is as risk. So, you know, uh, variance, or more specifically, standard deviation, is a measure of risk. Okay, so now I'm going to show you two gambling games. Okay, so the first gambling game is as follows. It's, it's defined by a random variable x1. Okay, and x1 is, is the following random variable. Either you will win $2 okay, with probability two-thirds, or you will lose $1, your minus $1, with probability one-third. Okay, and I'm going to show you. So do you want to play this gambling game? Yes or no? We can, we're going to try to analyze that probabilistically. And there's a second gambling game, okay, also characterized by a random variable, in this case x2. Okay. And in the second gambling game, you can either win uh, $102, you can either win $102 with probability uh, two-thirds, or you can lose 201, so you can either, you can lose $201 with probability one-third. Okay. So, Many things are similar about these two gambling games. For example, the probability to win in each case is two-thirds. The probability to lose in each case is one-third. Now, it is true okay, that the amount you win or lose here is much smaller than the amount you win or lose there. Okay? But since the outcome is random in each game, let's compute the expected value. So the expected value of x1, so what's your expected profit? Is two-thirds times two, is two-thirds times two plus one-third times minus one, which is equal to one. So you expect to make a profit of one dollar. So you might think, yes, I'm, 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 I, I would certainly be interested in this gamble. Okay, so you expect to make a profit of one dollar. What about this gamble? The expected value of x2. Okay, what is it? Well, it's two thirds times one, 102, two thirds times 102 uh, minus one third times 201. So two thirds times 102 is divided by three, you get uh, 204. Minus, you know, 201, which is 3 over 3. So this is also equal to $1. Mm, these gambles are getting more and more similar. Okay. So you see, you, in this gamble, if you take this gamble on, you expect to gain a dollar. And if you take that gamble on, you expect to, to gain a dollar. But now, if in the live class, when I ask students, and I ask them to answer honestly, would you take this gamble on? Many of them would say yes. Okay. Would you take this gamble on? Many of them would say no, and I would also say no. Okay. And, and why? Okay, and you know why we would take this gamble on but not that gamble on is because here, think about the situation where you lose, you lose a dollar. Okay, and think about the situation where you win, you, you, you win two dollars. And on average, if you played this game many, 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 many times, then you should take this gamble on and you will gain a dollar. But if you're asked to take it on once, okay, you know, your expectation, your expected winnings is a uh, dollar, but you could lose a dollar, and okay, that seems like a reasonable trade-off. I could lose a dollar, but on, on, on average, I'm expecting to win a dollar. Okay, and sometimes, I'm, 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 on, on the times where I win, I will win two dollars. Okay, but now here, my expected winnings is still a dollar, but now if I lose, I'm down big time. I'm down 200 bucks. Okay, and if I win, I'm up 102 bucks. Okay, and it's a very risky game, this one. But nevertheless, the expected values are the same, and, and the difference between these two games becomes, you know, uh, more evident when we look at the variance. So the variance of x1, so now we know the mean, so the variance of x1 is two-thirds, so we, we take the deviation, so this deviation is two minus one, two-third times two minus one squared plus one-third, one-third times minus one minus one squared, and so this, the variance of x1 is equal to two. Uh, because here you get uh, two-thirds plus uh, one-third times four, okay, which is four-thirds, so the variance is two. Here, the variance is, so the variance of x2 
is equal to two thirds times 102 minus one, 102 minus one, so the deviation squared, plus one third times two oh, minus 201 minus one, so minus 201 minus one squared. And this is a big number. So the variance here is approximately equal to is approximately equal to 2 times 10 to the 4, so 20,000. Okay, so the standard deviation here is square root of 2. And so you, we, we would say that if you take this gamble on, you expect to win 1 plus or minus, you know, 1.44. Okay, you expect to win 1 plus or minus, sorry, 1.41. Okay, and if you take this gamble on, so the standard deviation sigma is square root of 2 times 10 to the 4. So you expect to win... Uh, uh, 1, again, you expect to win 1, but now it's plus or minus the square root of 2 times 10 to the 4, which is 141. Okay. And so you see here, the gamble is you can win 1 plus or minus 1.41, so it's not that risky. Here you win on average, you, you win 1 plus or minus 141. Well, actually you'll either win 102 or lose 201, but, you know, the variance is sort of capturing that. The variance and the standard deviation are much larger in the second gamble than in this first gamble, and that's capturing this notion of risk, even though the expected values are the same. Okay. So variance can capture this you know, everyday phenomenon of which we, we, which we like to stay away from, which we call risk. Okay. Risk some, somehow is, you know, uh, typically we, we, we measure risk as downside, but variance captures risk in the sense of variability. Okay. okay. So let's erase and come back and talk about computing the variance. We don't typically compute the variance from the expected squared deviation. There's often a more convenient way, which is what I'm going to describe. So more, more convenient computation of variance. And this is often the way in which we do it. And when you want the standard deviation, you first compute the variance and then take the square root. Okay. So, um, let's look at what the, the variance is. So the variance is equal to the expected value of the, the deviation squared. Okay, and what's that? That's the expected value of the random variable x minus its mean. So x minus the mean squared. So this is all review of the definition. Okay, and now let's multiply out this square. So this is the expected value of x squared minus 2 mu x plus mu squared. Now, we're going to use this fundamental rule for expectations, which is that the expected value of a sum is the sum of expected values. So this is equal to the expected value of x squared uh, minus uh, the expected value of 2 mu x plus the expected value of mu squared. Okay. And now, you know, again, linearity of expectation, you can pull a constant outside the expected value. So this is the expected value of x squared minus 2 mu times the expected value of x, okay, and then plus the expected value of mu squared, which is just mu, mu is a constant, so it's the mean of the random variable. It's not random, it's just a constant. So this is plus mu squared, okay. So this is equal to, and now the expected value of x, this is mu, so this is equal to the expected value of x squared minus 2 mu times mu, so minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. So minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared is just minus mu squared. So this is equal to the expected value of x squared minus mu squared. Okay. And so let's summarize this in a box. So the variance, okay, which is the expected value of the squared deviations, is equal to the expected value of the random variable squared minus its mean squared. And what's that? It's the expected value of the random variable squared minus, what's the mean? It's the expected value. So it's the expected value of x, that's the mean, squared. So notice the difference. Here the square is inside, here the square is outside. So the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value of x. So this is a very important formula. Let's box it. This is typically how we compute variances. Okay. And what it means is that we have to compute two expected values. One 
for the expected value of the random variable, the other for the expected value of the random variable squared. Okay? And then we take the difference of one minus the square of the other. Okay, so let's do an expect, uh, let's do an example, an example. Okay, or um, examples, we'll do a bunch of examples. So the first one is the sum of two dice, one, the sum of two dice. Okay, so we know, so this is our random variable x, we know that the expected value of x is equal to seven. The expected value of a single die roll is three and a half, for two, you get seven, okay, twice that. Okay, so now to, to, to use this formula for the variance, we have to compute the ex expected value of x squared. So the expected value of x squared. So you take the squares of the possible values, weight by the probability of that possible value, and add. So this is equal to 1 over 36 times 2 squared plus 2 over 36 times 3 squared plus y2, because that's the, the possible value 2 for the random variable. And we're computing the square, because it's the random variable squared, plus 3 over 36 times 4 squared plus 4 over 36 times 5 squared plus uh, 5 over 36 times 6 squared plus uh, 6 over 36 times 7 squared plus uh, 5 over 36 times 8 squared plus 4 over 36 times 9 squared plus uh, 3 over 36 times 10 squared plus 2 over 36 times 11 squared plus 1 over 36 times 12 squared. So why did I write this whole thing out? Just to show you that there's, there's nothing suspicious going on. There's nothing magical. It's, you know, it's just a brute force calculation of the expected value of x squared. The standard way. Okay. Um, and, you know, if you, if you, now if you evaluate this whole expression, you are going to get uh, 54 and 5 sixths. Okay. So that's the expected value of the roll of the sum of two dice squared. It's the expected value of that square, okay? And the expected value of x is 7, so we, we expect from this formula, which has to be true because we derived it, so the variance is equal to um, the expected value of x squared, so 54 and 5 6, so 54 and 5 over 6, minus its expected value squared, minus the mean squared, which is minus 7, squ uh, uh, 7 squared, minus 7 squared, which is 54 and 5 6, minus 49, which is 5 and 5, 6. And we already got this value for the variance by computing the expected squared deviation. It's a good thing they gave the same answer and we derived that they have to. Okay, so this is a, another way to compute the expected value and it tends to be more convenient. Okay, let's do a couple more examples. Okay, so the Bernoulli, the Bernoulli or the binary random variable. Okay, remember, the random variable is equal to 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. So the expected value of x is equal to uh, p. We already computed this. Now what's the expected value of x squared? So you take the squares of the possible values and weight by the probability. So 1 squared is 1 weighted by the probability p. Okay, so this is uh, p times 1 squared, p times 1 squared plus 1 minus p times 0 squared, which is p times 1. 0 gives you 0, so that's p. Ah, interesting. So for the Bernoulli, the expected value of the square and the expected value of the random variable itself are the same, p and p. Okay. Okay. And so what do we get for the variance? The variance is equal to the expected value of the square, p, minus the square of the expected value, minus p squared, which is p times 1 minus p. Okay. So that's a useful formula to sort of have in your uh, pocketbook the variance of a Bernoulli. It's p times 1 minus p. Okay, what about the uniform random variable? The uniform. And now you'll see why it's much easier to compute this way rather than computing deviations and then taking the average. The uniform on 1, 2, up to n. Okay, so if you, and remember, if it's uniform on 1, 2, up to n, then the probabilities are 1 over n, 1 over n, up to 1 over n. So all the probabilities are the same. So we computed the expected value some time ago. Okay, so the expected value, so this is x. So the expected value of x, we computed it is uh, n plus 1, is 1 half n plus 1. Okay, in the usual way. Now let's compute the expected value of x squared. The expected value of x squared is equal to 1 over n times 1 squared plus 1 over n times 2 squared, times 2 squared plus and so on, plus 
1 over n times n squared, which is 1 over n times 1 squared plus 2 squared all the way up to n squared, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus all the way up to plus n squared, okay, which is 1 over n times 1 sixth n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1. So that's a common sum, okay, the, one, the sum of the first n squares. The n's cancel, and we get that the expected value of x squared is 1 over 6 n plus 1, 2n plus 1. Okay. And now we can get the variance. Well, the variance is equal to um, the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value. So we get 1 over 6 n plus 1, 2n plus 1 minus the square of the expected value. 1 over 4 n plus 1 squared which is 1 over 12 n squared minus 1. So now you can do the algebra to fill that in. Okay. I want to mention an important theorem. Okay. And it follows from the fact that, you know, we, we, we already said that the variance is always positive because you take deviations, you square them, weight them by positive probabilities and add. So the variance is positive. Okay, and so what does this mean? This means that, you know, uh, any way you compute the variance has to give you a number that's non-negative. Let's say it's, it's non-negative. It's not necessarily positive. It's non-negative. So this formula that we have for the variance, which is that it's the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value, says that the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value has to be bigger than or equal to zero okay, for any random variable. Well, this means that, you know, the expected value of the square, the expected value of the square is always at least as large as the square of the expected value, which is mu squared. Okay, so this is an important fact, okay, that the ex for any random variable, the expected value of the square is always, always, always as large, at least as large as the square of the expected value. Always. Okay. Now, you know, let me erase that side and uh, let me talk about linearity of, of, of variance. Okay. It's not quite as easy as the linearity of the expected value. So the expected value of a sum is the sum of expected values. Doesn't quite hold always for variance. Okay. And let's see when it does hold. And we'll use that as one, as one application of linearity of variance, we will compute the, the variance of the binomial. Okay. Well, let me erase and talk about linearity of variance. So let's talk about linearity of variance. So supposing you have two random variables, x1 and x2. And of course, this, this discussion can be made more general with if you have n random variables. But let's consider the case of two random variables, x1 and x2. Okay. And you consider a new random variable, x, which is equal to a x1 plus uh, b uh, x2. Okay. So we talked about what it means to take the sum of random variables. You view these as functions. Okay. So you just, you know, you, 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 you're defining one measurement, one function as the sum of, of, as a linear combination of two other functions. So a function defined in terms of another function, no problem here. Okay. So now we are interested in what is, is the variance of x. Okay. So we might guess, just like for linearity of expectation, we might guess that the variance of x is equal to a times the variance of x1 plus b times the variance of x2. And this would be a reasonable guess, except, unfortunately, it's wrong. So this is wrong. Okay. And so let's see what the actual correct formula is for the variance of a linear combination. And we go back to this way of computing variance, the, the, the convenient way of computing the variance. And we're going to use, and because computing variance is basically, you know, boils down to computing two different expectations, okay, we can use linearity of expectation whenever possible. Okay. So 
to, com to compute the variance of x, we need the expected value of x squared and the expected value of x. We need the expected value of x squared and the expected value of x. So the expected value of x is equal to the expected value of uh, a x1 plus b x2. Okay. So this by linearity of expectation is a expected value of x1 plus b expected value of x2. And if I wanted to, I could call this mu1 and mu2. Okay. So if I wanted to, I could say this is a mu1 plus b mu2. Okay, but you know we can just leave it in terms of expectations. Okay, and what I'm going to need is the expected value of x squared. So the expected value of x when I take the square of that is the square of this guy is a expected value of x1 plus b expected value of x2 squared. Okay, and now we can just multiply out this square. These are all numbers, so we all know how to do this. This is a squared the expected value of x1 squared plus b squared, the expected value of x2 squared plus twice a b plus twice a b, the expected value of x1 times the expected value of x2. Okay, good. Now, let's look at the second term that we need in order to compute the variance, which is the expected value of the square of x. So we need the expected value of x squared. But what is that? That's the expected value of ax1 plus bx squared. ax1 plus bx2 squared, okay. which is equal to the expected value. So I'm going to multiply out the square. a squared x1 squared plus b squared x2 squared plus twice a, b, x1, x2. Okay, and now, you know, we're dealing with expectation, with the expected value, so we can use linearity. We can say the expected value of a sum is the sum of expected values, and in fact, I can take these constants, a squared, b squared, and 2ab, I can take them outside the expected value, because that's what linear, linearity of expectation tells us. The expected value is a linear function, okay? So, sum, I can take it as, you know, the expected value of this term, which is a squared times the expected value of x1 squared, plus the expected value of this term, which is, I can pull out the constant b squared, so plus b squared, expected value of x2 squared, okay. plus I can, I can now pull out the 2ab, so the expected value of this term, I pull out the 2ab, plus 2ab, the expected value of x1, x2. Okay, so there expected value of x squared and the expected value of x squared. And the formula just says for variance, take the difference. Okay, so the variance is equal to, okay, is equal to a squared expected value of x1 squared, a squared expected value of x1 squared, okay, plus b squared expected value of x2 squared, plus 2ab expected value of x1, x2. Okay, so that's the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x, that whole quant, that, the expected value of x squared. So th this is the expected value of the square of x. Now we need the expected value of x squared, which is minus a squared, a squared expected value of x1 squared plus uh, minus b squared the expected value of x2 squared, okay? And now I'm going to have minus 2ab times the expected value of x1, expected value of x2. I want you know, to emphasize that this 2ab term is, they're slightly different terms, okay? Here I have a, a squared, uh, oh, sorry, it's x1 squared, it's x1 squared, and here it's x2 squared. Okay. So I want to emphasize that, you know, here you have the same type of expectation. It's expected value of x1 squared, and here it's expected value of x1, the, the quantity squared. So this is the expected square minus the quantity squared. Expected square minus the expectation squared. Okay. Here you have the expected value of a product minus the product of expected values. Okay. So let's simplify this whole thing. This is equal to a squared times the expected value of x1 squared. 
minus the, the, so this is the expected value of the square of x1 minus the expected value of x1 squared, okay, plus b squared times the expected value of the square of x2 minus the expected value of x2 squared. Okay. Now I have plus twice a b times the expected value of x1, x2 minus, and I'll put it in blue, the expected value of x1 times the expected value of x2. Derived. Okay. Can't argue with this. I just did all this horrendous algebra. Okay. For what? Okay. For this reason. So this here we will observe is exactly the variance of x1. It's the expected value of the square minus the expected value squared. That's the definition of the variance. And this is exactly the variance of x2. So this here is the variance of x2. And here we have a bizarre term. It's the expected value of the product minus the product of expected values. Okay. And that is in general a complicated term because remember from last lecture we, we, we observed that the expected value of a product is not necessarily the product of expected values unless the random variables are independent. Okay. That's one condition when this, this expected value of a product is equal to the expected value is equal to the product of expected values. So this is going to equal zero if x1 and x2 are independent. And we discussed this briefly when we talked about random variables. Independent random variables, the most mo common situation where you have independent random variables is their measurements of totally different independent experiments. You roll five dice and take the sum. You roll another five dice independently and take the sum. Those two sums are independent. You flip a coin, you flip another coin, independent. Okay. So we will consider the case of independent random variables, in which case we have that the variance of x, which is ax1 plus bx2, ax1 plus bx2, is equal to a squared times the variance of x1, a squared times the variance of x1 plus b squared times the variance of x2. I'll put this in a blue box because it is not what we were expecting. Okay. So initially we were expecting the variance of x2 equal a times the variance of x1 plus b times the variance of x2 if we had linearity. We don't have linearity. Okay. So it's so the funny thing that occurs, it's not a times the variance, it's a squared. So you take the square of the constants out. Okay, so you take the square of the constants out. Okay, so that's the first sort of surprising thing. But we might have guessed because, you know, the variance is the expected value of something squared. So if you multiply by a constant, then you in here you're gonna if you if you multiply delta by a constant or x by a constant, you're gonna square that constant and then pull it out. Okay. And this is not always true. So there's this other annoying term. So this only holds, okay. Technically, we say when this term is, is zero, we say they are uncorrelated random variables. But for our purposes, you know, we will we will typically only encounter this when the random variables are independent. Okay, so two caveats to the linearity of variance. It's not quite linearity. So you have ax1 plus bx2, you take out the squares of the constants, and then you can add variances okay, only when the random variables are independent. Well, you can, it's, it's a little bit more general, but for our purposes, when the random variables are independent. Okay, and let's take an example. So example. Well, a binomial. Okay, the binomial. Um, the variance, we'll take two examples. The variance of the binomial, okay, is, okay, so what is the binomial random variable? The binomial random variable x is equal to the sum of Bernoulli's, x2 plus up to plus xn. 
So each of these is an independent Bernoulli. Independent Bernoulli's binaries, binaries, Bernoulli's. And the success probability of each Bernoulli is P. And we already discussed the variance of the Bernoulli. Okay? So the variance of the Bernoulli, variance of Bernoulli is equal to P times 1 minus P. That was one of the examples we did. Okay? So you can go back in your notes and see that the variance of the Bernoulli is P times 1 minus P. Okay? And so, you know, we're taking a sum where the constants, the coefficients are all 1. Okay? So A squared and B squared in this example are 1. So the variance of independent or sum of independent is the sum of variances. Okay, so a special case of this is that the variance of a sum of independent random variables is a sum of variances. That's just a special case of this, okay? So here we have the binomial is a sum of n independent Bernoulli's. So the variance of the binomial is a sum of the variances is equal to p times 1 minus p plus p times 1 minus p plus n times p plus times 1 minus p, which is equal to n p 1 minus p. Okay, let's, do, let's just do one more example because it's an important example. Okay. One more example. The variance of an average. The variance of an average. For example, at the very beginning of the class, we took the average of n dice rolls. So the variance of the average of an average of n dice rolls. Okay, which are independent. Okay, so the variance of an average of n dice rolls and these n dice rolls, each dice roll is independent. So the total sum, okay, so x is equal to, you know, uh, 1 over n, because it's an average of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus all the way to plus xn. Okay, each of these is an independent dice roll. And so this is a sum, this is 1 over n x1 plus 1 over n x2 plus 1 over n x3 plus plus 1 over n xn. Okay, so the variance of x is equal to, okay, so now we have to pull out the square of the coefficient, is 1 over n squared times the variance of x1, variance of x1 plus 1 over n squared variance of x2, plus all the way to plus 1 over n squared variance of xn. Mm. Okay. And so this is equal to, well, but the variances of each dice roll, we know what it is. Okay, They're all the same. Okay, So the variance of, of, a, of a single dice roll was 5 and 5, 6. So this is 1 over n squared, okay, times 5 and 5 sixths times n, because there are n of them, okay. so which is 1 over n times 5 and 5 sixths. Oh, why am I doing that? Okay. So the variance of n dice rolls, so the, the standard deviation, so the standard deviation, uh, standard deviation which we call, so this was sigma squared, so the standard deviation sigma is equal to the square root of that. So 1 over square root of n times 5 and 5 sixths square rooted. So, you know, the square root of 5 and 5 sixths. And the most important thing that I want to point out here is that the standard deviation is behaving like 1 over the square root of n times a constant. 1 over the square root of n times a constant. And this is general, 
whenever you take the variance of an average where the average is for n independent random variables, which are basically the same random variable. Okay? So the variance is dropping like 1 over n times a constant. The standard deviation is dropping like 1 over the square root of n. Okay? And so we immediately see the justification for that curve we showed at the beginning. So the average, the actual average, if we believe what we said before, the average, the average will equal three and a half plus or minus the standard deviation, which is one over square root of n times a constant. Okay. And so you see, as you as you roll more and more dice, it's getting closer and closer. The, the, the average, the actual average you see is getting closer and closer to the expected value by, by you know, this error bar. You can think of this as an error bar, 1 over root n, which is going to go to 0 as n becomes larger and larger. Okay, so that's called the law of large numbers, and we're now going to sort of uh, basically derive that. But essentially, we're going to derive the 3 sigma rule, okay, which, which, which gives this standard deviation an, an important role in describing what are the likely outcomes of your experiment. And that's the punchline. Okay. So let me erase and we will discuss the three sigma rule. Punchline. Okay, so that was some intense algebra, but you know, let's just have a, a practice exercise to make sure that you know at least how to use some of the stuff that we just derived. So, supposing that you have two dice rolls, so exercise, practice. Supposing you have two dice rolls, x1 and x2, and you compute a score, your score is equal to, you know, 2x1 plus 3x2. Okay, so that's your score. Okay. So, question. Question one. What is your expected score? So, what is the expected value of your score? And question two. What is the variance of your score? What is, is the variance of your score? Okay, and I will give you two hints. The expected value of, you know, one of these dice is three and a half. So the expected value of x1 is equal to the expected value of x2, which is equal to three and a half. And the variance of x1 is equal to the variance of x2, which is equal to five and five sixths. Okay. So let's see if you can do this. Pause the video. One, two, three, four, five seconds. Okay. Now, if you're coming back just to see what's the answer and how to do it, well, you have to use linearity. Okay. And the expected value of the score is twice, so the expected score is twice the expected value of x1 plus three times the expected value of x2, which is two times three and a half, two, uh, which is uh, two times three and a half plus three times three and a half, so five times three and a half. What is the variance of the score? Okay, so the variance of the score now you have constants, so the, the, content, the constants square, so it's 2 squared, which is 4 times the variance of x1, plus 9 times the variance of x2. Okay, and why we can add these variances is because they're independent, they're independent dice rolls. So this is equal to uh, 13 times the variance of x1, which is the same as the variance of x2, so 13 times 5 and 5, 6. So if you got those, fantastic. Okay. Uh, but if you didn't, okay, sit down and practice okay? and read the chapter carefully if you want to learn more about how to use the tools of variance. But now I want to move on and, and develop the main, the punchline for this, uh, for this lecture. Okay, so the, so the punchline for this lecture. Punchline! Okay, so we're going to answer how good is the expected value as you know, representing or summarizing the outcome of an experiment. How good is, is the expected value of x for summarizing 
the experiment. And it turns out that we're going to use the standard deviation here. Remember, that's the square root of the variance. So, theorem. Okay. So, you have a random variable x. Okay. And, you know, you can compute its expected value. You have the expected value of x. Let's call this mu. And you have the, the standard deviation. So, the square root of the variance of x. That's, this is sigma. Okay. Now, you run your experiment and you see what's the value of x, what's the value of your measurement. And here's what we can say. We can say that most of the time, so approximately 90% of the time, and you can make this number 99% if you want, you can make it 99.9%, .9%, okay, and so on and so forth. Approximately 90% of the time, the value you observe for x, so the value you observe for x will be will be equal to, you know, mu plus or minus 3 sigma. Okay. So that means that the range for x, mu minus 3 sigma to mu plus 3 sigma is the range for x, 90% of the time. So 90% of the time when you run the experiment, you will find that the observed value of x will be within three standard deviations of the mean. And it is in that sense that the mean is a good estimate of the, of the outcome of the experiment. It's a good summary of the experiment. So it's going to be a better and better summary. It's going to be a more and more accurate summary if the, if the, um, this is not 36, this is sigma. This is sigma. This is sigma. It's going to be a better and better summary of the experiment when the standard deviation is small. Okay. So this is called the three sigma rule. Mean expected value plus or minus three sigma is the is the is 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 the range in which the random variable will lie with high probability. Okay, and now let's prove it. And, and to prove it, I'm going to show you two important uh, sort of uh, theorems in probability theory. Okay, they are important on their own, but we're just going to use it to prove the three sigma rule. So that's the punchline. It says that. You know, when the, when the, when the variance, when the, when the standard deviation is small, the mean is a great summary of what will happen. Okay. And so let's, let's do the proof. Proof. Okay. So there are two steps. Okay. The first is sometimes called Markov's inequality. So we'll start with Markov's inequality. They're not hard. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh uh, ingenious that these guys thought of these. And then the second is what's called Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, so let's just derive both of these inequalities. So let's look at, you know, the expected value of my random variable x. What is it? Okay, it's equal to the sum over the possible values of the value times the probability. Now, let us suppose that the, that the possible values are all positive. So there are no neg are all non-negative. So there are no negative possible values. So we call this a positive random variable. So, you know, assume, assume x is greater or equal to zero. So it can never be a negative value. In which case, you know, if we remove a part of this sum, you have to get something less, smaller. So this is at least as large as when, when I sum over the possible values that are greater than alpha, okay, for any alpha bigger than zero. So it's at least as large as this, the, the, the full sum is at least as large as the partial sum, where I only take the possible values that are greater than or equal to alpha times x p of x. Okay, but now in here, you know, x is always greater than or equal to alpha. So this is at least as large as the sum over x greater or equal to alpha of alpha p of x. And that's because x is always greater or equal to alpha. And then this is equal to alpha, the sum over all the possible values x greater or equal to alpha, p of x. Okay. And that's because alpha is a constant independent of x, the summation index, so I can pull it out. Okay. And this is the sum of the probabilities, okay, for all the possible values of x that are greater than or equal to alpha. So this is alpha times the probability that the random variable x is greater or equal to alpha. Okay. So 
if, if you have a non-negative random variable, so we typically just say positive random variable, assume that you have a positive random variable, then, okay, the probability that the random variable exceeds alpha, the probability that x is larger or equal to alpha is at most, so is at most the expected value of x divided by alpha. So, you know, what's the important punchline? The important punchline is the three sigma rule. Mu plus or minus three sigma is where what you will see 90% of the time. Okay, and it looks like we're proving something totally unrelated that, you know, this is called Markov's inequality. If you have a positive random variable, the probability that that random variable exceeds any fixed alpha, you get to pick whatever alpha you want, is at most its expected value divided by alpha. Okay, that's called Markov's inequality. And now I'm going to apply, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to prove Chebyshev's inequality. So the proof of Chebyshev's inequality is as follows. Okay, so let us consider, let us consider, consider, okay, the probability that the absolute deviation, okay, uh, so let me write this. Let us consider the probability that the random variable x minus um, mu minus its expected value, let's consider the probability that this is, is larger than or equal to t sigma. So some multiple, which I'm calling t times sigma. Okay. So let's consider this probability that there's a large deviation between the random variable x and its mean. Okay. Well, you know, if, if the deviation is large, if this, if this deviation is larger than t sigma, then that is the same as the probability that the deviation squared is larger than t squared sigma. x minus mu squared is larger than or equal to t squared sigma squared. Okay. And x minus mu squared is just the deviation squared. Okay. So let me define a random variable y which is x minus mu squared, okay? Then the expected value of y is the expected value of x minus mu squared. Okay, but that's just the variance of x. This is just sigma squared, the variance of x. Okay, so the probability that y is greater or equal to t squared sigma squared is at most the expected value of y okay, divided by t squared sigma squared divided by t squared sigma squared okay. but the expected value of y is just sigma squared so this is equal to sigma squared over t squared sigma squared which is 1 over t squared So what is this saying? This is saying that the probability that y, okay, the squared deviation is greater than t squared sigma squared is at most 1 over t squared. But the probability that y is greater than t squared sigma squared is exactly this probability, which is exactly this probability. So Chebyshev's inequality, which we have proved, is the following, that the probability that x minus mu is greater than t sigma is at most 1 over t squared. So I'm going to box these. Okay, this is an important inequality on its own right, but we mostly just used it to prove Chebyshev's inequality. Okay. So let's plug in t equals 3 when t equals 3, now the probability that x minus mu, so the probability that x deviates from mu by, you know, more than 3 sigma, the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to 3 sigma is at most 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 9. So the prob this 1 over 9 is a little bit, you know, larger than 1 tenth. Okay, so the probability 
that x minus mu is less than 3 sigma is at least 1 minus 1 over 9. Okay. 1 minus 1 over 9 is 8 over 9. This is 8 over 9. This is approximately equal to 89%. Hence, I said approximately 90%. Okay. And what is this saying? This is saying that the probability, the chances that you see a deviation that's less than 3 sigma is at least approximately 90%. So you will rarely see deviations that are larger than 3 sigma. That's the 3 sigma rule. Okay, that's the 3 sigma rule. And, you know, so this 3 sigma rule is very handy in practice that if you have any random variable, the chances are approximately 90% that when you run your experiment, you will see a result that's within 3 sigma of the expected value. So now that, you know, seals the deal on the way we are summarizing our complex experiment. The expected value, okay, tells us what we, what we will, will see in the long run on an, on an average basis. Okay. But then once we combine the expected value with 3 sigma, it also tells us what we are likely to see on a single experiment. When you run the, sing when you run the experiment once, 90% okay, of the time, okay, you will observe something within 3 sigma of the expected value. And when sigma is small, the expected value is a very good summary of the experiment. Okay? And so deviations from the mean are controlled by this guy sigma, the standard deviation, which is the variance. Okay, so that more or less marks the end in some sense of, you know, the module on probability. Okay? And we ended, you know, with this concept that uh, expected value is a very important summary of an experiment. Okay? And um, how good a summary of an experiment it is depends on the uh, standard deviation. Now let me show you a little bit of that in action, in practice. Okay, so you know we did the sum, the average of n dice. So the average of n dice, average of n dice. Okay. And we computed the expected value of the average was equal to um, three and a half. And we computed the variance of the average. We did, we did this earlier. The variance, variance of the average was equal to one over n times five and three, five and Five sixth, so one over n times a constant. So sigma, the square root of the variance, was equal to one over square root of n, okay, times the square root of five and five sixth. Okay. So when you run the experiment, you expect to see three and a half. Okay, and if we apply the three sigma rule, uh, plus or minus uh, three times this sigma, plus or minus three square root of five and five sixth over square root of n. So this is an error bar. Three and a half plus or minus this error bar, but look at this error bar. Okay, so if this is three and a half, if this is three and a half, okay, and this is n, okay, then, you know, your three and a half plus or minus three over root n, so a constant over root n is gonna behave like that. So your error bar is dropping, is approaching the expected value like uh, one over root n. And so you expect to see, um, you know, values that look like that. Okay, shrinking closer and closer to the expected value as you get the average of more and more dice. Let me show you in practice. So remember this experiment I showed you at the beginning where I, I, I rolled n dice and took the average and I showed you, you know, what the average looked like for different choices of n in my experiment. And you see that it was converging closer and closer to the expected value and the error bar so this error bar is, you know, this error bar is mu, you know, plus or minus three sigma, this number. And you see there, shaded in gray is the error bar. And look at how nicely the experiment follows the error bar. So what does the error bar show you? It, the error bar shows you the application of the three sigma rule. It says that, you know, the observed actual observed average is within three sigma of the mean, which is three and a half. So that's the theory in practice. The theory works in practice. And so, you know, the mean is a good summary 
up to plus or minus three times the standard deviation. Checking out.